The purpose of today's video is to continue getting the ideas of shorthand orbital notation and electron configurations in your head, and also show you definitely how you can use these representations to determine things about the elements. So we're going to start by writing out an example together again. And let's start with something like indium, number 49. So if I wanted to start with the shorthand orbital notation of indium, I would find the noble gas that has less electrons than indium, so that would be krypton, that's 36. And then I would go to number 37 and 38, which are over here in the 5S room. And then 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, and 48 are all here in the 4D room. And finally, number 49 is in 5P. This would be considered the shorthand orbital notation because it started with a noble gas. So because we didn't start the whole way over at 1s, but we picked up after a noble gas, that's shorthand. And it's orbital notation because it used the arrows and the lines. We could also write out the shorthand electron configuration by simply replacing the ideas of arrows with exponents. So we start with 36 again, 37 and 38, there are two elements in 5s, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, there are a total of 10 elements in 4d, and 49, there's one single element in 5p. This is the shorthand electron configuration because it starts with a noble gas. It doesn't start with note number 1s, so it's shorthand, and it's the electron configuration because it has exponents instead of arrows. Sometimes you're going to see these electron configurations rewritten, and this is actually how your textbook is also going to show it. Actually, we'll rewrite them so that the energy level or the principal quantum number goes in order. Even though the 4 is after the 5s, when we fill it, they'll rewrite it so that the 4 becomes before the 5. And you really don't need to do that. I just don't want it to surprise you if you ever see it. So, just like in our last lesson, once you have these shorthands written out, you do still need to figure out energy levels subshells, and orbitals. And today we're also going to add in valence electrons and unpaired electrons. So energy level, if we're looking at indium, we can just simply look and say which floor is it on. It's on the fifth floor, so that's five occupied energy levels. We can also just look for the biggest principal quantum number we wrote. Subshells are like rooms, so we can count those on the periodic table. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Indium is in the eleventh room, so there are eleven subshells. Orbital, we can use our noble gas divided by two plus the lines that have at least one arrow rule. So 36 divided by 2 is 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. It's noble gas divided by 2, plus any of the lines that have at least one arrow. And then we've got our valence electrons and our unpaired electrons. Valence electrons can be determined based on either one of these representations. You're really just looking for the biggest principal quantum number, which in this case would be 5, and you're counting all the electrons that are above that biggest quantum number. So basically, the electrons that are on the ring furthest from the nucleus. This would be a total of one, two, three, which you also could have seen here, which when we talk about why a lot of books do reorder these electron configurations, it truly is just so the valence electrons 
wind up on the end together. And then finally, the unpaired electrons are any place you have an up without a down, which is a lot easier to look at here than here because we can absolutely see that there's just one electron that's up. And these two types of electrons are incredibly important because those two types of electrons are what determines a lot of the properties that we'll be looking at in section 16. So we're going to do one more example together from the beginning just to make sure you got it. And then we'll look a little bit closer at those two different types of electrons. So for our final example, let's look at something that actually ends up down here. Let's look at curium, number 96. So if I want to represent number 96, I need to find the noble gas that has less than 96 electrons, so that would be radon. And that's 86 electrons there. 87 and 88 are in 7s. 89 is in 6d. And that's, again, where the flower room comes in, which is kind of weird, but that's what happens. Number 90, we jump over to the flower room. So this would be our 5F. And so that would be number 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 90. Oh, actually, 96, because that's where we wanted to stop. I apologize. So that's number 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, and 96. We can add up all of our electrons to verify we have it right. There's 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. We can also look at the room we're filling in currently and say we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 electrons in there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 electrons in there. Now that we have curium written out, we can turn it into an electron configuration. By replacing the arrows with exponents. We can rewrite our electron configuration in order a principal quantum number. So the valence electrons go to the end. And we can still count our energy levels, subshells, orbitals. Energy level would be the biggest number we wrote for the principal quantum number, so that's a seven. Subshells would be the rooms that we go through. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 rooms that are occupied. And orbital, we can take our noble gas divided by 2. So that's 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52. Again, 86 divided by 2 is 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52. We can look at our unpaired electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It has a lot of unpaired electrons. And we can look at our valence electrons by saying what's the biggest number we wrote. Biggest principal quantum number was 7. How many electrons are above a seven? There's just two of them. And just like the energy level and the subshell, things that we could find on the periodic table fairly easily, these two are also going to be found on the periodic table very easily. And in order to look at that, we're going to look at some quick examples together of some different elements so that we can see some patterns. So I'm just going to quickly draw out a rough sketch of the periodic table. So we can pick some representative elements from each of these areas 
to kind of drill out together. And we're going to find some patterns. Because the power of the periodic table is that the organization of it allows for so many patterns to form. Okay, so let's start over here in what we would call group one. Group one also sometimes referred to as the alkali metals. And let's just pick a random element, maybe here and here. And let's quickly draw out the shorthand version of those orbital notations. So this first one would be sodium. And sodium would start with neon, and then we would have one electron here in 3s. And maybe we jump down here to cesium, which would have xenon and one electron in 6s. Now what you might notice about these is that they have very similar orbital notations and very similar electron configurations because both of these, and really any of our alkali metals, any of the things in group one, start with a noble gas and then just add one more electron in. And because they are adding one more electron in, they both wind up with one valence electron and one unpaired electron. So everything in group one is gonna have one valence electron and one unpaired electron. Now in order to think about group two, let's make it easier on ourselves. For this example, let's just go right next door. If we just add in one more electron and turn sodium into magnesium and turn cesium into barium, all we're doing is filling in the second electron like this. So now, we have two valence electrons. Everything in group two has two valence electrons. And those electrons are gonna be paired up in the S subshell. So that'll be zero unpaired electrons. Two valence, zero unpaired. Now to look at group three, we're gonna to have to shift down a little bit. Let's do these two here. So if we're looking at the first one, scandium, we would start with argon and then add in the 4s and then 3d. And if we're down here at yttrium, that's going to be krypton, 5s, and then 40. Now you might already realize that no matter which of the groups we're looking at, the valence electrons and the unpaired electrons are always gonna be the same for all the members of the group, which is why these are so nice, because we really can just look at the periodic table and figure out how many unpaired and how many valence electron each of the elements have. So for our dungeon, the D block, we're gonna to stick to these first two rows and we're just gonna keep adding in one more electron the whole way. When we added in this electron right here, we did change the unpaired. So unpaired electrons for group three here is gonna go back up to one. But you might notice that the electron we added was not in the highest number. So the electrons that we're adding in the dungeon are not actually valence electrons so they still only have the two valence electrons from before. In the dungeon, valence electrons don't change because the electrons that we're adding go into an inner core. It goes into a smaller energy level. And that's actually gonna be true as we add more and more electrons into these dungeons. None of these electrons that I'm adding are going to go in as valence electrons. 
So all the way across the dungeon, the number of valence electrons is going to stay at two. None of the dungeon gets more valence electrons. But what they do get is more unpaired. Because as we add the next electron and the next electron and the next electron in, we're going to get a total of five unpaired electrons before we start pairing them back up again. And then we go the whole way to zero. So across the dungeon, we started with one unpaired electron. We keep adding an elect unpaired electron in until we get to the maximum number of bunk beds. And then it turns back around and goes the whole way until we have no unpaired electrons because they're all filled in. You're going to see something very similar happen in the party room. So if we look at, say, these two. Here we've got helium, 2s, and then 2p. This boron has a total of five electrons. Here we've got argon. 4s, 3d, and then 4p. But either way, the number of valence electrons doesn't change because there's 3d would not be valence. So in both cases we have three valence electrons. And the number of unpaired electrons doesn't change because both of them only have a single unpaired electron. And really, if we focus on just looking at the trend, in the party room, you have three lines. Before you get to the party room, you also had to have a sunny room that had two electrons. The first element in the party room is going to have a total of one, two, three valence electrons and one unpaired. The next element in is going to have a total of one, two, three, four valence electrons and two unpaired. The next one in is going to have a total of one, two, three, four, five valence electrons and one, two, three unpaired. And then you're going to start pairing them back up. So that's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six valence and only two unpaired and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence, one unpaired, and two, four, six, eight valence, and zero unpaired. So if we look so far, in an S we go one, zero, and then in the D we went one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And then in the P we go one, two, three, two, one, zero. You're basically counting up to the maximum number of bunk beds in each type of room, and then counting back down for the unpaired. And for the valence, you're starting with one, two, everybody in the middle gets two. And then after you get to the other main block, the P block, you start going three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Similarly in the F block, you're gonna see the same type of pattern. So F blocks always get both the electrons in the S first. They get one electron in the D and then we skip down to the F. And so, because let's say this is the 7S, this would be the 6D and the 5F, the F are never valence electrons. So all the valence electrons the whole way across is still going to be two. And in terms of unpaired electrons, it's slightly different because you also have that unpaired electron in the dungeon before you get any unpaired electrons in the F. So these, this first guy here, are actually going to have two unpaired electrons. Three, four, five, six, seven. And you can actually get a total of there's seven there plus the one more, so that would be eight, and then it turns back around.
and those would be the unpaired. So I'm hoping at this point you see how, because of the way the periodic table is set up, and because of the way that we look at the electron configurations and orbital notations, there are two main patterns that you should be able to pick out very easily, and that would be the unpaired as well as the valence electrons. So if I do a quick sketch here for valence, we've got one, two, everybody in the middle is two, including everybody down here in the F block, and then we go three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then for unpaired, it goes in the S block, we only have one set of bunk beds, so that's one zero. In the D block, we have five sets of bunk beds, so that's one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, zero. In the P block, we have three sets of bunk beds, so that's one, two, three, two, one, zero. And in the F, because you always start with one that's still chilling here in the dungeon, it actually goes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And as long as you can remember the trends on the periodic table in terms of unpaired and valence electrons, then you will have no problem answering the questions that we start looking at tomorrow. Absolutely, let me know if you guys have any questions. Otherwise, we will continue looking at the periodic table and the trends it allows us to determine in tomorrow's lesson.